Hi, everybody, and welcome to Neuroscientist Talk Shop, UTSA's Neuroscience Research Podcast. Today is Leap Day, February 29th, 2024. We're talking with Dwight Burgles, who is professor in the departments of neuroscience, biomedical engineering, and otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and the Cavley Neuroscience Discovery Institute at Johns Hopkins University. Dwight's lab is focused on the interaction between neurons and glia and communication and function in the nervous system and health and disease. And I kind of smile when I say that because it sounds like a description of all of neuroscience in a way, but, um, but he means it uh, maybe more, more literally than a lot of other people do. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that. <laughs> so this is not his first visit to the podcast. What was here in January 2018. And when he was here before, we talked about a special kind of glial cell, the oligodendrocyte precursor cell. And I listened to that podcast today. It's episode 181 for anybody who is looking for it. That'll get you there quicker. And I really recommend it. The material is still super interesting and current, although I'm sure it's not completely up to date. These cells are critical to the brain's response to energy and, uh, injury and disease. And they are a cool cell type that you probably don't know about. Very cool. And uh, But that isn't the only thing Dwight works on, and that isn't what we're going to talk about today. Today we're going to talk about a different topic that's another big project in his lab, and it's the mechanism responsible for correctly wiring up the auditory system at the earliest stages of the development of the circuit, auditory circuit. So hi, Dwight. It's really good to have you back. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. And with us also is Marina uh, Silvera, <laughs> who is becoming a regular on the podcast. You can tell she's a regular because I'm getting closer to pronouncing her name correctly. Yeah. And she works on auditory system too. Yeah. 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 Hi, everyone. It's good to be here. And me, I'm Charlie Wilson. So, Dwight, um, the role of sensory experience in the development of the sensory pathway has been a great theme for neuroscientists for a long time. Uh, one really interesting finding about this is the recognition that sensory systems create patterned activity in sensory pathways early in development, even before real sensory experience is available. And uh, these patterns mimic some of the statistical and spatial patterns that are created during real experience in a, in a sort of cool and clever way, as if the nervous system kind of already knows a little bit about what the real world is going to be uh -huh. like, and it's creating patterns like that. And uh, and it sets up the basic connections of the sensory system as a rough approximation of what the adult connectivity will actually be. This was first discovered in the visual system, I think, and at least I, that's the earliest I know about. But you've seen a very similar thing in the auditory system. So I'd like to eventually get down into the really mechanistic neurophysiology of this, but could you just start us with a general description uh, description of the phenomenon and why it matters for sensory circuits and you know, what the basic lesson is, developmental lesson mm -hmm. is? Yeah, this is, this is a really fascinating question. What has emerged from studies of many developing sensory systems is that they exhibit a period of intrinsic or we call it spontaneous activity but of course it doesn't arise from nothing so it's not truly spontaneous but we you know we use that term uh, very freely when we talk about it what it means is that this is activity that is seen not in response to some sensory input so it seems like it is generated by the developing nervous system itself and the ways that we think about this are you know, maybe by analogy, um, you could think about learning to play baseball. So we think about a lot of like learning kinds of paradigms, learning to play baseball. So like if you were just starting to play baseball and you were learning how to hit the ball, um, the first thing you might do is uh, you would go to the batting cage and you would be placed in front of a machine that will generate pitches of a certain type. You know, it doesn't have a lot of flexibility, but It'll pitch at about the right speed and in the right general area. And by doing so, then you learn to approximate, you know, how quickly to swing the bat, how to put the bat in the right position. You can get the bat on the ball. 
And then, you know, if you do that and you master this, then you might be ready to face a real pitcher who's highly unpredictable and is going to throw knuckleballs and curveballs. And, and this is the real world, right? You don't know what to anticipate in the real world, but you need a period of training to get the basics of the response down. And I think this is how we think about um, this training period that happens early in development is that, you know, one of the goals of the nervous system is to interpret the external world. And it does that through um, creating sensory organs that are responsive to sound or to light or to touch. And then it needs to take those organs and connect them to the brain and partition out information about the external world. And, and so we think about this, these connections forming. And during that early period, it needs some sort of training, right? To start producing the right patterns of activity in ways, as you suggested, that are sort of like anticipating what they will experience later. And, and so, you know, just to riff a little bit more on that, I think, one of the challenges that the nervous system has is that it's early on, it's designed for a lot of plasticity, right? Things are growing, there are connections between neurons that are very flexible. Many of the neurons that are produced will actually be removed. Many of the connections that are formed will be removed or reorganized. So this is a period of extraordinarily, extraordinary plasticity in the brain, but that's also very risky, right? It's a very risky period for development because if it is exposed to inappropriate types of activity or inputs, then you could develop in a way that would be inappropriate. And so I think one of the things that the nervous system does, it provides it with very stereotyped types of activity. You know, it's quite constrained in terms of the frequency and um, the number of, let's say, action potentials that are produced. And so that kind of predictability is important to do the job of refinement early before it's exposed to the external world. And some of the ways that we think about this is like if you imagine like plasticity as being like an accordion, early on the accordion is pulled wide open and you have all of this space that you can work with. But when you get exposed to the external world, you want, you want that to be quite a bit narrower. and what the activity seems to do is it closes that window a bit. It's not as if there's no plasticity at all, because certainly there's, there's very robust plasticity that happens once these sensory organs sort of come online. That is when the eyelid opens or when the middle ear drains of fluid. Um, there's a whole nother period of plasticity that happens, but that plasticity seems to happen in this range. And that is less likely to sort of go off into this area, which could be then very damaging off of, you know, off of the realm. So we think that this stereotyped activity does this initial kind of um, change in the, the bandwidth of plasticity, if you will. So in the visual system, one thing that you can say about visual system without ever having seen the visual world is that things that are the same thing tend to activate similar places in the retina, close by places in the retina. Right. So neurons that are near each other in the retina are likely to be activated together. And so if you just activate them together and get them to wire up as if they were going to be activated together, that helps. That gets you part of the way. I think so. And, and Yeah. And there's a lot of destructive kinds of, you know, there's a, we talk a lot about in collo colloquialisms about like use it or lose it and you know, how fire together, wire together, and all these kinds of things that I think there's some truth in these kinds of things that, you know, if you don't reinforce connections, especially early on, they tend to be lost. And so a lot of what we think the spontaneous activity does is that there are connections there already. It's not like it's forming lots of new connections or these connections are already there, but it's, it's reinforcing them and stabilizing them and removing or punishing the ones that are not appropriate. Because there's always there's a lot of inappropriate things that are also happening. And so there's, it's sort of handshaking. You know, there's a lot of handshaking and then they really um, stabilize those, those connections among neurons, as you say, that are going to be responsible for um, processing similar features of sensory stimuli. So the, the auditory equivalent of 
receptors near each other in the visual system are receptors near each other in the auditory system, and they have in common the same frequency specificity. That's right. So, uh, and what we see in the in the sensory pathway is responses to the particular auditory frequencies stay organized and stay separate separated by frequency. Is this is this where that comes from? This is starting all of this activity is starting at the mo- at the periphery, at the most peripheral place, at the actual That's right. receptor. So it's training the entire pathway. If it started part way through, it would it wouldn't train the early part. Right. I think this is right. So if you think about, I mean, a lot of processes in development are activity dependent. Right. The cells need to have. Um, calcium influx, and they need to have fluctuations in their membrane potential to show that they are part of something really active. And if they are disconnected from everything, they tend to undergo apoptosis early on. And and so you can see how if you were to put this this driver of activity early enough in the pathway, then you would stimulate all of the pieces that you need. And you know what we see in the auditory system is that is that these supporting cells, which surround the hair cells, are activating the hair cells as if they were activated by sound. That's not entirely true because it's not the same kind of stimulus, but the hair cell experiences a depolarization as if it had been exposed to, you know, vibrations. So it's a beautiful way. Get yeah. activated together. Yes, and so yeah. there's another element of that is that the spontaneous activity is spatially and temporally constrained so that it's not as if the entire auditory organ the cochlea gets activated all at once and and all the activity goes through it's like little pockets of it get activated at one time and it's spatially constrained so that you're only activating the sensory hair cells in a small region of the cochlea and because the frequency representation varies along the length of the cochlea you are essentially activating cells simultaneously that will eventually be responsible for uh, sensing similar frequencies of sound. So it's a random kind of thing. We haven't talked a lot about the details yet about how this amazing thing happens, but but it does happen. And <laughs> just you can see it happen, and it's amazing because just by having these supporting cells do this locally it activates these groups of hair cells that are going to be responsive to similar frequencies of sound. So it's great for us to go ahead and start talking about how it happens because yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a whole like little mini organ in there whose purpose is to generate all of this activity and which goes away during development once it's done its job, which is a remarkable thing. And then, and then the mecha- you've worked out the mechanism that's generating the activity and the reasons why it is the way it is. So all of that follows from the mechanism. Yeah. So why don't you tell us something about the mechanism, which is quite complicated. Yeah. Uh, everybody, like, uh, hold on to your seat. Yeah, let's, like, put <laughs> seatbelts on here. and, like, you know, say have a little shot of coffee here so you can pay attention. <laughs> now, you know, it's like a fantasia. It's like you – I think we had talked about this a little bit in the seminar where, you know, you we often as scientists – think about optimum designs of things, you know, that it would be the simplest design that would make the most sense. And in this case, if you wanted hair cells to be active without sound, you know, you might uh, either have the hair cell itself have some oscillation that it just does some through some mechanism, or it might have, there might be another cell nearby, which just stimulates it just simply like, oh, just depolarize it somehow, activate that cell. Or maybe like, why don't you just, you know, twitch the hair bundles because that's what you know normally happens but you don't want to do them one at a time yeah it's important to do them in groups it's you have to do it right so it'd have to be a large a large sort of area of them and so anyway what we what we find is something um which was quite quite unexpected and that is this process of hair cell stimulation involves the supporting cells releasing ATP. It's a it's a molecule. Obviously, ATP is used as a source of energy inside cells, but for many, many years, ATP has also been known as a neuromodulator. It is a neurotransmitter itself, and there's a whole family of receptors that 
when they bind ATP, they will stimulate, you know, changes inside cells. So these supporting cells, which are located immediately next to the hair cell, so the inner hair cells are the ones that are responsible for transducing sound, these supporting cells release ATP spontaneously. And we originally thought that that ATP would actually just, you know, kind of float over and bind to receptors in the hair cell and activate it. Oh, simple process, very easy. But it does, it does not work that way. It, it actually, the ATP that's released by these cells acts back on itself. And we call that like autocrine signaling. And so the cells self-stimulate through this process. And once it binds to a receptor in the supporting cells, it triggers a cascade of events, which triggers that cell to release ions. And this is because that receptor is coupled to the release of calcium in the cell. When calcium goes up in the cell, it binds to a channel, which is calcium dependent. So it's sensors for that rise in calcium. And when that channel opens, there's a huge efflux of chloride ions from these supporting cells. And um, it's really massive. I mean, this is like probably one of the biggest ion fluxes like mm -hmm. I've ever seen. And so it must have a massive chloride concentration. It seems that they have very high intracellular chloride concentration that they maintain. And so when that channel opens, chloride just rushes out of the cell. And, um, and so when those negative ions leave the cells, it actually pulls a, a counter ion out with it. In this case, it's potassium ions largely because those are the channels that are open in those cells. And it is actually that potassium which causes the hair cell to depolarize. So, you know, you go from this neuromodulator to trig triggering a, a, a signaling cascade inside the cell, which then opens up a channel, which causes ion flux, which then draws out another ion, which then is what's actually responsible. And, and it seems like incredibly cumbersome and weird that it would have evolved such a complicated mechanism to do this. And I think in retrospect, it makes more sense because this kind of a pathway is used for uh, fluid secretion by epithelial cells in other parts of the body. And these supporting cells that surround the hair cells are epithelial cells, essentially. And so they, if you, if you imagine, they had evolved over millennia to have this sort of like toolbox, this whole signaling mechanism to allow fluid secretion and salt secretion. And what seems to have happened in the inner ear is that they just repurposed that thing, which it exists in, in its entirety, and repurposed it to activate the hair cells. And presumably, evolutionarily, that would have been easier to do than create an entirely new mechanism to allow stimulation of the hair also cells. It has some cool properties. I mean, in some ways, oh, it's, it's very cool. sort of optimal because, <laughs> yeah. because ions um, diffuse over a, some distance. And so the potassium released here may very well depolarize a little it, it group. Is, yeah. It, it depolarizes a group of hair really cells. It's a group of hair yeah. cells. Exactly. Them one at a time. So it allows that to happen, you know, over, so it allows that spatial part of it. And the other thing that's really, I think, beautiful about this system is that um, these changes in ion concentration outside cells are, are quite slow. And as a result of that, they cause these waves of depolarization to happen. And those waves of depolarization are sort of the perfect driver for bursts of activity. And what we see conserved among sensory systems is they use burst firing early in development to initiate these refinements. It's not enough to say, I'm gonna generate one action potential every second or 10 seconds. A lot of the synapses that are formed early in development, they're, like, they're not really strong yet. And so there's a lot of failure. And if you think about, you have to go from the periphery, from the cochlea, across many, many synapses until you get all the way up into the cortex of the brain and that is what happened. The spontaneous activity actually makes it all the way there. But in order to do that, I think it has to have a significant safety, you know, safety factor. And so it generates a number of action potentials to make sure that, you know, glutamate is released and you have synaptic transmission all the way along this pathway.
Um, and, and these slow depolarizations are really beautiful for doing that, for doing like, you know, repetitive firing of the cells. It doesn't have to be so precise and not like hearing, you know, which is incredibly precise. And, and, um, this is more of like, you know, we just, we want to, we want to drive a burst of activity through all of these synapses and they're going check, 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 check. And then they go, check, 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 you know? <laughs> so they, that's really what they're meant to do. And they can, you know, we've done estimates of this with in vivo imaging where we can monitor the activity of these cells. And the cells will experience, you know, like 10,000 or more of these, th- of these events, these discrete events over this developmental time period, which is, you know, a little bit less than a couple weeks in, in rats and mice, which we study. So one thing for me that's really fascinating is that the ATP release only happens like during development. And after here on set, you don't have more just a spontaneous release of ATP. Right. So do we know what drives the ATP release and what stops the ATP release? Because it's so precise before here on set and after here on set. Yeah, this has been like just a real, you know, it's a thorn in my side kind of. I mean, only in the, from the sen- sense of... uh you know, scientific curiosity and and the fact that the more we understand about the mechanisms, the more we're able to conduct manipulations exactly. to disrupt it and understand what its function is. You know, we tear, tear apart the machine. That's what we do. And, and so, no, we don't. And we don't know the mechanisms that are responsible for ATP release. Um, I speculate a lot because we, you know, we've done a handful of experiments here and there, and it really seems like it's a, it's a channel. Mm -hmm. And so this makes it kind of unlike conventional synapses, you know, conventional synapses involve secretion, which is like, you know, we concentrate neurotransmitters into vesicles and the vesicles are induced to fuse with the membrane. And then that produces a high concentration opposite a low affinity receptor and that kind of thing. (laughs) <laughs> but here we really think that this is these are ion channels at the membrane that are permeable to ATP. And those things can open and of course there's no ATP outside, all the ATP is inside. And so when these channels open, the ATP can flow through the channel from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell, and there it's available to bind to the receptors. So I think good evidence, pretty good evidence that it's a channel, because if you mm-hmm. block secretion. Um, it doesn't affect the spontaneous activity. Oh. It'll block the downstream, you know, activation, but of the neurons, but not the secretion of ATP. So then, what channel is it? Channel's not known. Um, there is this curiosity in the in the cochlea where all of these supporting cells that we study are are coupled to each other through intercellular <laughs> chains, known <laughs> as gap junctions. And these gap junctions are known to be permeable to ATP. If they're unpaired in a hemi channel, they call it. And so it's possible that there's just a few hemi channels at the cell surface. And if any one of those opens, even for a fraction of a millisecond, it could allow enough ATP to come out to produce one of these very discrete, spatially localized events. And the duration of those events wouldn't depend on how long ATP was around because you have all of these slow processes. G protein, yeah, exactly. calcium. That's all water, extends all it that. very long in time. Exactly. So you take this little tiny event and then everything just spreads out in time because you have second messenger signaling. And then, as you're saying, like you have ion release and then the ions have to diffuse away and everything. So you can take this little tiny event and expand it out in time. And... So I favor that idea. I would say there's still a lot of work to be done on yeah. identifying the molecular mechanism, assuming that it's only one mechanism. And of course, we don't we don't know that there could be other ways. You know, there are lots of there's lots of channels that are permeable to ATP, especially in volume activated channels. And um, and so I think people that are familiar with that field often ask me, like, well, because they're of all this ion movement that happens, there's osmotic changes in the shapes of the supporting cells. And so people are always like, well, is that, you know, is it just some sort of swell, swell activated channel or something like that? But see, the problem is that the ATP is upstream of the osmotic change. So it's not the osmotic yeah. change that induces the ATP release. It's the reverse of that. So it doesn't seem like it's, it's a swell channel or something like that. It's much more something that um, I kind of favor... Um, a lack of 
I really believe in like this stochastic processes in, in science. And, and it, it, if you look at the patterns of activity, it is very stochastic. Like these events happen in kind of seemingly random locations in their different sizes. They can be small events, large events. And, and ion channel behavior is very consistent with that where open times are quite probabilistic and, you know, they, they can have that degree of variability. So I like that part of it too. It's the events are not quantized. So one of the characteristics of synaptic transmission is that you have neurotransmitter packages packaged into vesicles, and then the response is quantal. It's quantized. They tend to be quite similar in amplitude and things like that. These events do not look like that. They're really variable. And so I think this kind of fits a bit more with channel open probabilities and stuff like that. That's wonderful and yeah. very revealing to watch one of your films because you're seeing all this happening using optical methods. Yes. So these events are, uh, they're not just something you see through an electrode, but you actually see them in space and you see how far they spread and how long mm -hmm. they last yeah. and where they were. There's just so much to learn just by watching. Yeah. Uh, somebody grew up like watching one cell at a time and yeah. a network doing cells all doing different things. You think, are you, how could you ever know this stuff? And, but these methods are just give it to you. Yeah, I was I was really profoundly influenced in this by my PhD advisor Stephen Smith, who was a pion is a pioneer in in optical imaging, and he you know he was involved in imaging the very first calcium transients from okay. astrocytes and you know early adopter of multi-photon imaging and all sorts of things like that and and so i was like in the lab when this was all happening and it, yeah i was using electrodes and i was very envious of many of the other people <laughs> in the lab and i think i kind of you know, that was really an aspiration for me, wanting to be able to study, you know, the kinds of things that we can do with electrodes now with optical methods, because they give you that, that spatial aspect of things. And this is, you know, we're talking about very complicated organs, essentially, where there's a lot of communication going on between cells that, you know, you cannot resolve just with a recording the activity of one cell at a time. And even multi-electrodes and stuff, it doesn't give you the richness that you get with imaging. And of course, I think most people know now that you know, imaging methods are absolutely transforming science and, and certainly yeah. neuroscience is really being transformed because it allows us to look at, you know, patterns of activity among cells that we would never have predicted with, would communicate with each other. And, and, and certainly for my own interest, which is looking at that, the interface between neurons and glia, it's been incredibly uh, useful. It allows us to see those interactions where we, we couldn't see them before. Also, because glial cells often don't use the same kinds of signaling. So glial cells are often thought to be electrically silent, you know, that they, they don't have action potentials the way that neurons do. They have very small fluctuations in their membrane potential. So all of the historical studies in neuroscience, which involved like you know, putting an electrode into the brain where you read out the electrical activity of neurons, all, you know, the astrocytes and the other cell types, they're always silent. So their activity patterns were invisible. And it was only the advent of optical methods, which allowed us to now see that those cells were actually responding to neurotransmitters and neuromodulators, but just the generation of second messengers and things like that, not through generation of action potentials, because that is not what they do. And, and so I think, you know, glial biology has been absolutely transformed by the abil ability to do this kind of imaging. And we're just consistently, like, just could we keep, you know, like pushing, pushing, pushing as hard as we can to develop new tools, new probes, new ways of, because it's opening up like this whole new understanding of these cells. This yeah. problem yields itself to it because the sensory epithelium is a. Is an epithelium. You can look down on it. It's you, fairly you flat. To it's true. Drill it's, a hole in yeah. the brain and stick a right. camera down in there yeah. to, to see it. So true. So true. <laughs> it's a. It's a little bit easier to work with than uh, you know, like a, a cortical volume. So what? Um, I mean, I I know that you 
having one of the benefits of having understood the mechanism that's giving rise to this is the ability to do away with it at will and see what happens, yeah. <laughs> yeah. which is um, which is huge because it's the only way to dissect it. So, can you give us a little rundown of what happens to the auditory system if it has to grow up without this mechanism? Yeah, I would say I, I'm, I'm torn a little bit because part of like I love science just for science's sake, and there's a lot of this discovery in the auditory system where we, you know, determine some of the all these little complicated mechanisms that go on just for the beauty of understanding it, because it just is, and it's fascinating Definitely. to study. Yeah. <laughs> but it, as you point out, it has has this added benefit that the more we understand about the sort of mechanisms that control it, we can then devise ways of very like with surgical precision going in and disrupting it. And that's incredibly valuable as a scientist. And as a, as a good example of that, when people were starting to look at spontaneous activity, because we did not study, we did not discover spontaneous activity in the auditory system or anywhere else, it was described actually originally, I think initially in, in chicks. So in the, in the avian system, which was very accessible in a model for studying um, auditory system development. Um, you know, so they, you can do experiments where you disrupt the activity, but disrupting activity typically would involve like removal of the cochlea mm -hmm. <laughs> or lesioning things. And then you could study how, you know, the, the, um, sensory, the auditory centers of the brain respond to that loss of activity. But of course you've completely abolished activity. You've also like deafferented, so there's neurodegeneration that happens, and and um, and you so test it afterwards and ask. Well, and that's the most important <laughs> point. You can't like ask hear. them how well they hear yeah. if they don't have it, and so it's basically limited to sort you know like these kinds of either like some some ex vivo physiology or some histology. But if we have this ability to disrupt spontaneous activity, ideally what we'd like to do is be able to just selectively turn off or turn down the spontaneous activity and then let the animals um, age and then start to ask them, what, well, how, are, how well do you hear now? Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and so those are the kinds of things that we've been able to do now with this new molecular understanding. So we can do targeted manipulations of the spontaneous activity where we remove selectively this one channel in the supporting cells, it silences the supporting cells, it depresses the activity of the hair cells, and then we let the animals age and we start to present sounds to them. And we ask like, okay, well, what is the responsiveness of auditory neurons to sounds when they're deprived of this activity? And, um, and it's, qu it's quite dramatic. I mean, the effects are not subtle and and it's multifaceted, I would also say. So one of the first things that we noticed was that um, the gain or sensitivity of the neurons in the auditory system was much higher when they were deprived of that activity. So it seems like the default program for many of the neurons in these sensory systems is to be like very sensitive. And it, and it makes sense because think about it, this, the cell is trying to talk to other cells and listen to other cells in the circuit during this very dynamic time where the signals are quite weak. And so it's, it's trying to, it's very, it wants to be very responsive early on, but then as it becomes integrated into the network, it has to make sure it's not too responsive. Otherwise there would be runaway excitation, the potential for seizures and abnormal, you know, run on signaling and things like that. So, so we think that one of the things that the spontaneous activity does is as it reinforces these connections, it allows the neurons to adjust their excitability so that it's in a, a, a narrower range, which is more closely adapted to what it will experience in the external world. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be sensitive early on, but the moment that the ear canal opens and exposed to the external world, it doesn't, it doesn't want the the amplifier turned up to 11 anymore. <laughs> it wants to, it wants to bring it down into like a four, you know, so then it can get softer and louder and it can be in a physiological range. And so that's one of the things that it does. I think it related to that because um, it seems to control the excitability. What we see is that individual neurons in these auditory centers, um, when they're deprived of spontaneous activity, are 
responsive to a wider range of frequencies. So we talk a lot about um, frequency tuning in the auditory system, and it's this amazing feature of neurons in these auditory centers is that they can be quite narrowly tuned and will only respond to neurons in, you know, uh, 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 to, to sounds of a particular frequency, let's say. It's kind of analogous to the work that Hubel and Wiesel did in the visual system where, you know, they, these neurons would only respond to light stimuli in a particular orientation and things like that. So there's analogous things in the auditory system and neurons become progressively with development more narrowly tuned. And what we see when we deprive these animals of the early spontaneous activity is that their tuning remains really quite broad. So presumably the animals don't have good um, pitch acuity. Yeah. Yes. Is that so? So these are the the questions of um, going from like neurophysiology to uh, sort of um, behavior and asking questions about how well do they hear? How well do they interpret? Uh, vocalizations of you know their their siblings or their Not their parents. Physics. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I part of the challenge with this, and and like I'm just gonna like make lots of caveats because we we haven't done those experiments. Is be is is that um, it, it's quite challenging to do these kinds of behavioral experiments, and especially challenging in mice. Mice are like really poor. They don't learn. They're kind of hyperactive, and they. There's, there's a lot of variance that happens when you do experiments like this in mice. And so you often need um, large numbers of animals to do comparisons. And because of the manipulations we do in the mice require um, complex genetic manipulations, we often don't get a large number of animals. And it takes a long time to get animals that have just the right manipulation. And so, you know, to get 30 animals of one genotype is very, very hard for us and would cost a lot of money, you know, these kinds of things, and many, many hours of you know, breeding. I think and, in general, we know that if yeah. tuning curves get broad, yeah. acuity goes down. Right. Yeah. That's I think these are... Law of right. psychosis. It goes down. Yeah. I think it's challenging to assess these things in mice as it is. You know, yeah. people often talk about um, detecting tinnitus in mice, and there's lots of arguments about what actually they're doing. And th these... These animals are really good at like, you know, they, they can subvert your best <laughs> experiments. Yeah. And yeah. so it, it, these are not definitive, I guess, is one, the one way. And I tell you, what is definitive is watching the activation of neurons that respond to sound. Absolutely. And so I feel like this is like we're, we, we can be quite confident of this and the implications are this. But of course, you know, in an ideal situation, we would have the ability to really start to do behavioral tests on the mice and, and ask, like, can they, are they, are they having problems discriminating frequencies of sound that are quite close to one another? You might expect that. And are they hypersensitive? Things like that. Um, yeah. So this is, this is sort of like the future. And I, I think we would love to do this kind of work, but um, it's a it's a question of like resources and feasibility. It really yeah. is sort of like that would take so much, so many resources that we wouldn't be able to do a lot of other things. So I kind of like I'm always like a lab that we're always doing resource allocation, kind of like and prioritizing and 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 um, and are so we just haven't done it. Yeah. And I'll stop are there talking spontaneous again. mutations in humans and any of these genes that are important for this? Yeah. Maybe we could find <clears throat> people yeah. who didn't have this colicker. Had Interesting. Organ and did, did yeah, that's true. Had yeah, that's a good point. Experience it mm. in utero, yeah. and because then it, they would tell us everything about yeah. it. Yeah. One other talk that I have that's probably like not completely related, but when we think about hearing loss, right? So going on the other spectrum, when you have hearing loss, mm -hmm. have damage in the cochlea, you have homostatic plus test in the centroid pathway, and you see this enhanced excitability and loss of tuning as well. Do you see any parallel on this mechanism? Because we don't know really well how this enhanced excitability happens after he was in the first right. place. So, meaning, is this a spontaneous activity that happened during development could potentially happen again in some disease? Is that no? Is that a hypothesis? Yes. There, I think not maybe in the way that, um, that we understand the, the mechanisms sort of start to finish, 
but there are implications that things like purinergic signaling is involved yeah. in injury. And so people have done things like sampling the cochlear fluid after injury and they find elevated levels of ATP there. Oh wow. And we know that, know that the, yeah. And then we know that there's because ATP, you know, ATP is released by damage. So mm -hmm. so cell, oh. cells that are um, cells that are damaged and cells that are going to die through apoptosis will start to release ATP in a pulsatile way. And that is, a, it's a attractive signal for macrophages and, and professional phagocytes. And, and so, and also it stimu we think it stimulates repair processes, but in general, that's like, that's like a, I'm, I'm in serious trouble here. You know, if I start to release ATP, there's just some serious trouble going on. And so that starts this like repair. And if it's really bad, then just like engulfment and removal so that that cell that's dying doesn't damage all the other surrounding cells. So, so there's like a lot of circumstantial evidence that damage to the ear causes release of ATP. And people have actually in a bulk way uh, been able to show that L ATP is elevated following like uh, exposure to intense sound. And um, on the receptor side, I mean, there's evidence that um, there's a whole host of purinergic receptors that continue to be expressed in the inner ear in various cell types, in the neurons and the supporting cells and the hair cells even. So there's there they have the ability to sense ATP that would be released. Um, but I think what's really lacking is understanding, you know, like what are the conditions necessary for that ATP release? And then what effects does it have on these different cell types? But I agree. Mm -hmm. I think this is a really um, very kind of like rich area to for further investigation because uh, it's very prevalent. It probably plays an important role in injury response. And there, I'm not, that's not to say there isn't evidence. There is evidence for this from analysis of mice that lack some of those purinergic receptors. So depending on which purinergic receptor you remove or abolish in the mice, you can show that they have increased sensitivity to intense sound or they do not recover as well from, uh, from an exposure to intense sound. So that all you know, seems to suggest that the purinergic signaling plays a role in injury response. Um, but you know, which cells release it, how, and, and all of the myriad of effects that that might happen in response to ATP release is not not well you know, understood it's like yet. It's pretty complicated. Quite complicated. Yeah, yeah. Like injury is very very complicated. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I think this is like <laughs> you know because one injury is not the same as another, and you know there's a there's a bit of like all hell breaking loose kind of problem where yeah. you know stuff's going around everywhere and it's chaos. And, and so in a lot of ways, it's so much more complicated than this developmental thing, which is very stereotyped and yeah. which is almost too hard for us. It's also hard to <laughs> say forever. So forget about injury and recovery. Oh, yeah. yeah. So thanks, Dwight. That's, that's an incredible story. And we're really uh, grateful you came and explained it to us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dwight. That was really great. It's a pleasure. Yep. And Marina, thank you. No, thank you, Charlie, for having us. And this has been Neuroscientist Talk Shop.